Hey folks, Chris here. I wanted to record a quick video and address a comment that I received that I thought was actually going to be a good jumping off point to kind of show you some of what qualifies me to teach subdivision surface modeling. There was a comment that somebody said that I had an inaccurate knowledge of subdivision surfaces and then proceeded to give me a little mini lecture and a comment about the nature of subdivision surfaces. The comment was made on my video, A Better Way, Modeling Without Subdivision Surfaces. The point of me doing that video was to show you that there are often alternate ways to model something, and in this particular case, one that doesn't require subdivision surfaces, and that may work for a particular model. But the comment was that I had a misunderstanding or an insufficient understanding of subdivision surfaces. I thought this is going to be a good point for me to show some things that I've done to help you understand why I think I'm qualified to do tutorials about subdivision surfaces. So let's do this. Let's jump over on my website and I'm going to show you some things. First model I'm going to show you is a model of a microscope that I did back in 2001. I modeled this and even though I've, I have revised some of this model since with subdivision surfaces, but at the time I modeled this using this direct polygon modeling technique that I talked about in my latest tutorial. So since I didn't have subdivision surfaces available, I did what I had available and it was a simpler modeler and it took a while. It was a challenge for me. In fact, I remember using an application, an odd 3D application from France called a Moppy that had surprising modeling control, but it didn't have a subdivision surface technique. It was all direct polygon modeling. And so I still have this model and I've imported it into Blender and I've done some revisions to the model to clean it up. This is another model that I did, and this is a subdivision surface model. This was for a client that needed this. This was had some other challenges to it. The front face right here, I modeled it as a flat surface. And after I had modeled the contour of the body, I used a lattice, a deformation lattice, to adhere it to the uh, body of the shape. Uh, this is another old model that I had done uh, back in the... I don't know, 2004 time frame. And at that point, I had begun using a modeler called Wings 3D, which in fact did subdivision surfaces. And it was one of the first programs that I knew of that was really taking to subdivision surfaces. And at the time, they called it box modeling. You can actually still download Wings 3D to this day and use it. A lot of the paradigms that they developed are widely used now. In fact, Blender uses some of the kind of paradigms that they had begun to develop. This is still a model that I have, and I have revised a little bit of it, but, you know, I learned how to do subdivision surface modeling by doing projects like this. So here's another model that I did. This, again, is mostly a subdivision surface model, although there are some components that I did do direct modeling on it, just because it seemed appropriate for them. And I just did this as an exercise. This wasn't done for anyone. So if we jump back over, this is just another, this was a modeling exercise that I did just for the sake of it. I, I, I saw an interesting uh, digital clock, early digital clock from the 1970s, and I kind of took it and modified it and modernized it just as a modeling exercise. But this is a subdivision, set of subdivision surface objects. Here's another subdivision surface model that I had done. In fact, let's jump over here and look at this in some greater detail. This was just another modeling exercise that I did, and I modeled this in Modo. Uh, Modo's not one of my favorite programs in the world. I don't like its user interface, but it's got a pretty robust polygon modeler and subdivision surface system. And if we jump back over here, you can see it at different angles has a lot of detail and it was just a modeling exercise. So subdivision surfaces. Here's a tennis racket that I modeled. This was purely an exercise that I had done a couple years ago. So that's all subdivision surfaces. I have a little bit of displacement. I have a displacement texture for the handle to give the handle a little bit more of an interesting organic look to it. This was just another exercise I wanted to do you know, just another exercise, both for, for a model and for lighting and rendering. I got, just call this my expensive watch. <laughs> Subdivision surface model. Okay. 
then here's another interesting project. This is the only project that I ever did that the client ripped me off and didn't end up paying me, even though I'd done a series of illustrations of this product. This is uh, mostly subdivision surfaces. And then a camera. This was more of just an exercise in modeling. Here's another modeling exercise I did. This is all subdivision surface modeling. And of course you can see my Atari model that I've used in several tutorials. This is a mix of subdivision surfaces and direct polygon modeling. This next set of renderings was a collaborative project that I worked on and my task was to produce the actual digital models which were subdivision surface models. These were actually rendered in Octane, uh, were rendered by one of the other guys on the team, a guy named Scott who was a very good digital artist. I produced the models and then he took them and put them into rendered them through octane and in some cases composited them into photographs so the great thing is no one would have ever known that these were digital renderings and if you look here you can see his work in compositing it into a photograph that was taken it looks really good but the models are mine i did the models and here's the tricky part about this this project didn't come with really good measurements or reference material all I had, all that they gave me were a handful of photographs taken of these units in a warehouse with somebody's iPhone. And they gave me the total basic dimensions of the object and then I had to take the photographs and reverse engineer the models from the photographs as closely as I could. And so it meant knowing that the model was X wide by the, the depth and the height I took the photographs and removed as much perspective as I could and then figured out what the measurements interpolated all the measurements in between and then produced the digital model I think I did this for five or six of these it was a lot of work but they turned out really well and these are all subdivision surface models in fact I include screenshots of the models which I did in moto so you can take a look at it anyone could probably pull these up and complain perhaps about my topology here or there but at the end of the day these produced really good objects and they produced really good renderings and I was confident in the topology so don't let the subdivision surface police walk in and say you're not doing it right as long as you get a good rendering subdivision surfaces is a fairly forgiving technology and you you know as long as you get a good rendering who cares but I teach in my tutorials good principles behind good subdivision surface models in order to get good results, and I usually try and adhere to those. Here was another big project. This was a modeling project and an animation project that I embarked back in 2006, and I had to model this on the computer hardware that I had at the time, which, if I remember correctly, was a MacBook Pro that had a single 1.67 gigahertz G4 processor and 768 megabytes of RAM. And I had to build this model and do all the animations within that hardware. And it was a challenge at the time. And I built this model using polygon modeling and subdivision surfaces in a program called Wings 3D, which is still available to this day. But one of the aspects of its modeler was that it expected your polygon mesh to always be a closed volume. We don't think about that much now, like in Blender doesn't require subdivision surfaces being a closed volume, but that's kind of how they did it. So that was one of the things that I had to work around their odd requirement of it being a closed volume. But because I had such meager hardware to work with and memory restrictions, when you're working with subdivision surfaces, every time you add another layer of subdivision, your polygon count increases substantially. Polygon counts go up really quickly. And, you know, in this modern day and age where we've got gigabytes and gigabytes and gigabytes of RAM, it's not a big deal. But at the time, the way Wings 3D worked is that you worked on the cage and you didn't have real-time interactive subdivision surfaces. When you would get to a point where you would want to subdivide it, you would actually apply a subdivide command and it would subdivide the model and then that's what the mesh became. So you would have to keep an original cage mesh and then you would duplicate that and, and subdivide it and you would check it to see if the topology was right and 
part of the process with that, as far as optimizing the geometry for memory standpoint, was I would then go in and I would remove any kind of planar loops that I could to get the polygon count down. And it gave me an appreciation for this direct polygon modeling approach where you would necessarily only really want to model the polygons that you were going to render with and, and not have lots of extraneous polygons that you really didn't need. And it was a complex model and it took me a while. I actually flew down to the plant where these were built and I crawled all over one and took a whole bunch of measurements so that I had key measurements so that I knew how to take those measurements and apply it to get the real model because I had some photographs of it and they sent me a bunch of printouts of, of CAD files. So I probably, at the time, it didn't dawn on me that I might have been able to ask them if they had you know, actual CAD files. I mean, now we could say, hey, could you send me step files and I could bring them into a CAD application and convert them into a polygon mesh, which then we could render. But at the time, I'm not even sure that that was an option. So I modeled all of this by hand. It was a very complex model, but you know, I did it. You learn subdivision surfaces and how to model complex topologies and you can do some cool stuff. So we ended up doing bunch of animations of this. A comprehensive engine protection system monitors engine oil pressure and coolant temperature. If coolant temperature reaches a critical level, the vehicle control module automatically lowers the maximum RPM, reducing truck speed. The system also monitors engine oil pressure and indicates potential problems by illuminating a light on the display panel. And then we launched off onto some of the other projects that were smaller in scale, this was another example of one of those hand forklifts and it was a similar thing. They sent me some basic measurements and some photographs and they actually sent me this as a physical product to model from because this handle was pretty complex and it had some weird complex topology and so at least I had a physical of that to work with and so I measured key points and then just began building the model from that. So. It's one of those things where once you begin to learn polygon modeling and subdivision surfaces, you can model a lot of stuff. Sometimes you can hit your head against the wall for a while trying to figure out how to get the topology to work right. But subdivision surfaces is a fairly forgiving technology. And you don't necessarily have to have absolutely perfect geometry to get a good object to render with. Uh, so I try and teach good approaches to subdivision surface modeling, but don't think that you always have to do things exactly 100% right. Here's a model that I don't actually have any renderings of. I think at some point the client showed me the renderings, but again, I was working with another fellow who was doing the renderings. My task was to actually produce the digital models. This is a, a bottle for honey that you would find in the grocery store. And they sent me uh, some basic measurements and some photographs. And I said, you know, I think I've actually seen these in the store. So I went to the store and bought the exact size of the, of the bottle that we need. And, and I used that as a reference. I had a pair of calipers that I used to measure specific points on the model because it's got this honeycomb thing going on. So I would measure, I would get the symmetry point and then I would measure from here to here. And I would measure these specific points and I would be very careful about figuring out what the space is along the x-axis and the y-axis so I could plot the points that I used as reference to begin building the honeycomb and then the rest of the model. And uh, so that's how I did it, but it's a subdivision surface object. You can build all kinds of crazy things with subdivision surfaces 